These are called tektites. They're naturally occurring pieces of glass. What makes them really interesting is their shape. How can these figure of eight or dumbbell shapes be formed by natural processes? Tektites are formed really in the same way that any glass is formed. You take some rock, maybe in the form of sand, and you heat it up until it melts. Then you've got molten rock. If you cool it down quick enough, it doesn't have time to form a crystal structure. And in that case, it forms an amorphous glass. Just like the glass that you're used to, tectites are made of silicon dioxide. The reason they're not transparent like human-made glass is because of impurities. In fact, they're a similar color to obsidian. Obsidian is also a naturally occurring glass. Obsidian is volcanic, meaning it forms by taking that molten rock from under the Earth's crust and putting it outside via a volcano. Outside is very cold compared to under the Earth's crust. So that molten rock cools down very quickly, too fast to form a crystal, so it forms an amorphous glass. And it has the same color as tektite because the impurities are the same. But these weren't made by a volcano. These formed in mid-air, immediately after a meteorite impact. So imagine this, a meteorite hits the Earth, all that kinetic energy is turned into heat energy. The rocks underneath the meteorite impact are instantly turned into liquid rock and loads of it is thrown up into the atmosphere. And as those blobs of liquid rock fall to the ground, they start to cool and they cool so quickly that they form pieces of glass. But why are some of these tectites dumbbell shaped? Well, look, imagine this bit of blue tack is one of the falling blobs of molten rock. This one has some angular momentum and because it's spinning, it feels a centrifugal force, a force pulling it outwards, pulling it apart. And I really do mean centrifugal, by the way, not centripetal. I'm talking about the apparent outward force that a mass feels as it rotates like this. And so long as it cools down before it splits in two or before it hits the ground, you end up with that dumbbell shape. Isn't that amazing? So there you go, tektites. But that is not the end of the story and it's not the end of this video because as I took a deep dive into these tektites, I found out that the study of spinning fluids is really interesting and it crops up in different areas of physics. For example, the Earth itself is a spinning fluid blob. It's mostly liquid and it's spinning. So what shape should the Earth be? I'm Kyle, a uh, lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. My field is broadly soft matter flows. In Newton said that it should get flatter at the poles and bulge at the equator as it spins faster and faster. Uh, whereas René Descartes uh, said that it should elongate at the poles. That's Dr. Carl Baldwin there. It's been known for a long time that Newton was right. The Earth is an oblique spheroid. But what if you were to spin the Earth faster and faster? might seem like a pointless question because the Earth isn't spinning faster and faster, but actually the study of spinning liquids helps us to understand more than just the shape of the Earth. And so, yeah, the shape of the spinning Earth, the shape of spinning atoms, the nuclear physicists start assuming that a, an atom is like a droplet, just to make the, the physics a bit simpler. Even weirdly, the shapes of uh, spinning black holes in higher dimensions, these kinds of, these shapes uh, crop up again and again. And so yeah, it was really nice to just have an experimental way to create these shapes and hold it in front of a camera and say, look. All right, stop there. What is that? This is the best bit. Kyle has created artificial tektites in the lab. This is really cool. So let's take a step back. Another scientist, Dr. Richard Hill, was experimenting with spinning droplets of water. The first thing you have to do is levitate the droplet of water so you can spin it in place. You do that using strong magnets. So water is very slightly diamagnetic. That means that when you put it in a magnetic field, it gets a magnetic field of its own, but in the opposite direction. I've got some pyrolytic graphite here. That's much more diamagnetic than water, though it is pretty weak as a phenomenon in general. And look, you can see how the graphite is repelled by this magnet. If you want to hold the graphite in place, instead of just falling off all the time, like you can see here, then you need to arrange your magnets in a clever way. I've got four cube magnets here that go north, south, north, south. They cancel each other out in the middle, so you've got this magnetic well for the graphite to sit in. 
Richard Hill is doing a similar thing, but with electromagnets. He's creating a well for his droplet of water. And then he's blowing a jet of air on the side of the droplet to get it spinning. What you see when you do this experiment is that the droplet becomes an oblique spheroid. It becomes wider, fatter, just like the Earth, and that's a stable equilibrium. But as you spin the thing faster, eventually that oblique spheroid shape becomes an unstable equilibrium, so that any perturbation in the surface grows and grows until it flips into a different, more stable equilibrium arrangement, and that's the dumbbell shape. In fact, there's even a three-lobed stable arrangement that has been seen experimentally. The theory goes that the shape will flip from being an oblique spheroid to a dumbbell shape at a specific point that depends on the strength of the force pulling it back in. In the case of planet Earth, that's gravity. In the case of a droplet of water, it's surface tension. In the case of atomic nuclei, it's the nuclear force. This uh, mathematician, uh, a guy called Chandrasekhar, showed that as you flatten and flatten and flatten your uh, sphere into a pancake, it becomes unstable and at some point it's going to start pinching off and forming more of a dumbbell shape. The limitation of this experiment is that you have to deal with pictures and videos. You can't measure the object directly because it's a liquid. That's when Kyle had an idea. Candle wax is sometimes used as a kind of laboratory analogue of um, modern rock. I knew it had the right properties to levitate. Like, right, we'll just let's heat it up, spin it with some air blowing on it. It's like on one side, yeah. so it just starts spinning faster and faster. Yeah. So at some point, it's just going to reach that point where it solidifies. And at whatever uh, spin speed it has at that time is going to dictate what shape it has at that time. Measure um, very accurately the shapes of those candle wax shapes and compare them yeah. to the 150 or so year old uh, predictions about what the exact shape of a spinning droplet should be. And that had never been done experimentally to actually collect right. these shapes and measure all the little aspect ratios to show that the theory works. And it just so happens that by doing that, we're, we've come up with a way of making artificial tectites as well. At some point, the two lobe will pinch off and become two droplets again. So that thin That's bridge undergoes an different. instability, a, something called a Rayleigh plateau. Instabil instability. You might get something that looks a bit more like uh, this one. So like nice. a I haven't got one like teardrop shaped one. So if you were to visit the Chicxulub crater in Yucatan, Mexico, as you look around contemplating the death of the dinosaurs, you may notice a few of these. I did my first ever live stream over the weekend for my Patreon supporters, and it was really good fun. So thank you, Patreon people, for being so lovely and for continuing to support the channel. I want to talk about the pleasure of using a tool when you really understand that tool. And specifically, I'm talking in the context of the sponsor of this video, which is Skillshare. One of the ways I sometimes animate is with HTML. So I'll use JavaScript to move things around, and I've figured out how to turn that HTML animation into to a sequence of files that I can import into my video editing software. And so you can animate elements on the page like, like text and images or scalar vector graphics, and that's a really useful one. And I've got it to work in the past by just kind of finding code online, not really understanding what I'm doing, but eventually getting it to work, just sort of bodging it together. And you know, it's satisfying when you get it to work at the end, but the process leading up to it is really stressful. I'm a real advocate now of online video courses because you spend an hour of your life learning how to use a specific tool and then it's just a real pleasure to use it when you really understand something. You know, now when I'm animating in that way, it's more about the, the artistry of it. And so the whole process now is a pleasure and, it, and it's faster. Skillshare has loads of web development courses, but they've got loads of other stuff as well. Photography, videography, digital design, interior design, loads of different stuff. Have a look because you might find that when you take the time to really understand how a tool works, it's a real pleasure to use. You get access to everything for just $10 a month. And because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first 500 people to go to school.sh forward slash Steve Mold 7 will get two months absolutely free, no strings attached. That link is also in the description there. So check it out today.
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.